Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to some of you. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you're all safe and healthy and enjoying your summer. Uh, my name is Elena Silva. I direct the pre-K-12 education team at New America. For those who do not already know or are not familiar, New America is a DC-based think tank and civic enterprise. Uh, we're a collection of uh, problem solvers, researchers, analysts, writers, and a lot more. Uh, we're all connected by a vision for a better future for our nation and for our world. Education is a big part of this vision. So you'll see if you, if you visit our website, which we hope you will, that our education program spans from birth all the way through higher education and the workforce. Uh, we're designed this way to address the whole trajectory of learning so that we can see and we can attend to some of the essential true lines of that trajectory, including educators. Those who support, who guide, instruct, assess, and play uh, an immeasurable role in the healthy development of, of infants, children, youth, and adults. At New America, we have had a sustained focus on improving the educator workforce for years. We've been analyzing how we recruit and train teachers and leaders, who we recruit and train to be teachers and, and leaders, uh, how they're developed and supported in the classroom, what policies enable this type of strong preparation and support, and more. From analyzing micro-credentials to launching a national network of Grow Your Own programs, our work puts educators at the top of the list of education policy priorities. Uh, we know we're not alone in this work, and we're deeply appreciative of all of you who have worked with us to strategize how to take teacher preparation to the next level, to modernize this system so it can reflect and serve today's students. In particular, I'd like to thank Bank Street College's Prepared to Teach initiative for all their work and their willingness to collaborate on this event. Uh, shouting out a big thanks also to my colleagues at New America, um, just the best group of people to work with. So thanks you all. Um, a big thanks all, all, to all of you as well, uh, who I'm guessing are here because you also see this as an important moment, a time when the education field and beyond is rethinking and reimagining a lot of our systems, a lot of our uh, policies. It's a time when we're trying to figure out what matters most for kids who historically and now still get the least. And this is our priority. This has been our vision and our goal for a long time. Um, we can't serve them well if we don't give them great teachers. And we can't give them great teachers unless we can create accessible and supportive and sustainable pathways to teaching. As a field, we, we know what works for teacher preparation. There's a tremendous amount of research already out there, decades of research on how to develop and support a strong, diverse workforce of teachers. Um, we have a great lineup of folks to come uh, and we wanna have, make sure we have time for questions and to get you all engaged in this. So I'm gonna pass the mic now over to Karen DeMoss, who is the executive director of the Prepared to Teach initiative and is gonna set the stage on what we know from all this research I just mentioned. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena, for that inspiring introduction. It's been a great pleasure for our team to work with New America on this event. We're very excited to be here, um, especially to learn from the two panelists that we have uh, coming up following this brief uh, summary of the research that we have. I think we're gonna share some slides. There we go. Um, we are, my role in this presentation is to share with you some of what we do know in terms of teacher preparation and how we can transform that to best serve students. Next slide. First is there's three, did you hear next slide? There we go. Three big areas that we have some strong research on that we should all keep in mind as we're thinking about pathways into teaching uh, that workforce or teacher effectiveness and teacher stability and teacher diversity are all important key teacher quality issues. So these are three areas that we should all focus on as we're thinking about our pathways. Next slide. In terms of teacher effectiveness, pretty clearly teacher effectiveness increases with experience. The more you've been able to teach, the better a teacher you are. The, the longer you've taught, the more you can improve students' achievement. You can reduce disciplinary referrals. You can increase their attendance patterns. You can improve motivation. In particular, novice teachers have a lot to learn in a lot of growth areas in order to get that experiential base. Two thirds of teaching growth actually happens in the first couple of years of somebody's placement. And teachers do continue to improve over time. Having experienced teachers also in a, inside a school also helps new teachers get better. So teacher experience is an important aspect of this quality work that we're looking for. Next slide. 
Second big aspect is really an equity issue. When teachers quit, students and schools lose, especially those students who are most concerned with addressing historical inequities around. So teacher turnover itself costs a lot of money for the country, uh, costs about $10,000 to $20,000 per teacher to replace a teacher. Uh, that's usually lower in the rural areas and higher in the urban areas. And those dollars when they're new teacher turnover are just wasted dollars every year that we have to expend to hire new people. That revolving door of novice teachers is even more problematic when you think about the students. It robs students of the chance for a strong, strong learning opportunities. Those who are underserved in particular face this reality. Turnover rates are about 70% higher in schools with high proportions of students of color, and lots more teachers with under four years of experience serve students of color and those fam from families with low incomes. Turnover also affects the entire school. Um, it's disruptive because you lose institutional knowledge. You lose knowledge of students, those relationships that are so important. And relational trust diminishes, which also diminishes student engagement and outcomes. Next slide. Third piece of this triumvirate is that diversity actually really does matter. Uh, racially and linguistically diverse teacher workforces uh, benefit all students. Research is clear on that. And then in particular, um, having a same race teacher improves educational and life outcomes for students of that race. You get increased math and reading scores, decreased absences, more equitable disciplinary referrals, and increased li likelihood of enrolling in college. If a, a child who is Black has a teacher um, who is Black in elementary school, they're 13% more likely to enroll in college just by that one indicator alone. But we have a huge mismatch in this country between teacher and student racial diversity. 80% of teachers are white. Over half of our students are BIPOC students. So that's a very big gap that we've got to start addressing. Next slide. So the current teacher preparation system, the landscape, the, the approaches, the pathways that we have, all of these affect teacher quality. Next. Got a couple of sort of dense slide coming, dense slides coming up about our various teacher preparation pathways. And I'm going to pause here and say that at the end of this presentation, as you heard in the beginning, um, not only will there be a recording, but this slide deck, um, which does include a lot of references and the end of the slide deck, plus a handout um, that gives you some more detail on some variations across these common features of the pathways. All of those things will also be available um, at the website after this, this presentation after the, the event today. Generally speaking, we have two big pathways for going into teaching. We usually call them traditional pathways and alternative pathways. We're gonna focus pretty specifically on um, institution of higher education, traditional pathways, and then fast track alternative pathways in these first two rows here. The traditional pathways um, are education focused degrees, typically pre-baccalaureate, but with lots of master's programs also. Eight to 16 weeks of student teaching. That's where people go into the field and do their clinical clinical practice alongside another teacher. Um, that's usually one of the things that happens before somebody uh, has a solo teaching or a teacher of record kind of a position where they're hired for the classroom. And you can only have that solo teaching or that teacher of record after program completion, including your licensure test. That's the basic traditional preparation program. Fast track alternative programs are usually post-baccalaureate, if no education background in particular is required, you have one to six weeks of training or observation in classrooms, after which time you get a full position paid with benefits to do solo teaching. Um, you're not fully certified as a teacher yet, and you often um, have done some of your licensure tests, but not necessarily all of them. So those are two common um, categorizations of pathways, but we want to encourage people to think differently and think more about the attributes that would happen if we had extended preparation programs, regardless of the particular pathway that something is categorized under. We're going to focus today on two that have really strong potential benefits and some strong research behind them, residencies and grow your own programs. Residencies are district and preparation co-constructed programs that are designed in particular to bring people into districts and or to create the kinds of high quality preparation that we think all teachers should have. They usually have at least a full year, sometimes two, working alongside a mentor in a classroom before they're hired as a teacher of record for solo teaching. And solo teaching only happens after program completion, including all licensure tests. 
Grow Your Own programs share those features, um, but though they really focus on recruiting uh, from racially and linguistically underrepresented groups from the local community, the length of placement can vary in some of those programs because GYO often use a traditional or a residency approach depending on the particular populations that they're recruiting into the field. Next slide. So these pathways have impacts on those big three buckets that we were working, looking at earlier. Um, stability and diversity from these two pathways, these two big pathways, traditional um, and fast track alternatives. The, uh, the traditional programs, generally speaking, have graduates who are largely white and female. Obviously, that's not the case in minority serving institutions, but in general, if you look at the populations across the country, that's the case. They're not well represented after they graduate in high need or hard to staff schools. Their certification areas are often mismatched with what the labor market needs. So for example, they might graduate with an undergraduate in, um, in, early ch in childhood or early childhood education when the district needs bilingual. And they're, um, they are retained in the field at about twice the rate of fast track alternatives. Fast track alternatives are much more likely to be teachers of color and male than traditional pathways. So real plus there, they're much more likely to work in high need areas or hard to staff schools. The challenge is that they're also much more likely to exit the profession quickly than traditional pathways are, particularly teachers of color who leave at even faster rates from these pathways than their white counterparts do. So we're losing some of our potential um, population of teachers that we would really like to keep in when they come through these pathways. Extended preparation pathways, whether they are registered under either traditional or alternative, um, those programs, both residencies and grow your own, are much more likely to be teachers of color, to work in high need schools, to stay in the profession, and to have direct linkages to districts hiring needs. So a lot of benefits come from those. Next slide, please. In addition to these pieces about diversity and staying in the profession, those teacher, those people who come through high quality preparation programs are good for students. Next slide. We know that there's an evidence of positive impact on student achievement from year long residencies. Those very often do include grow your own approaches. Over time, achievement impact improves even more. There are also likely other outcomes as well through increased experience, stability and diversity as we saw early on when we talked about the kinds of things that impact student outcomes related to experience and stability and diversity. Next slide. So what are the attributes of these high quality preparation programs, whether they're classified technically as either alternative or traditional? Regardless of the pathway name, they include district preparation program collaboration, co-construction, this idea of this year long side-by-side -side placement of the inspiring teacher with an accomplished mentor teacher, an integration of theory and practice um, where you've got the theory and research, not just over here at the university and the practice over here in the school, but they really do try to make those two things fit together. And Additional supports is needed to meet academic and licensing requirements, such as test uh, success on the tests and funding for candidates while they work. Next slide. That funding is a really important piece because affordability is a really important piece. Aspiring teachers can't work for free and learn how to teach well. It turns out that across the country, our undergraduate students, about 40% of undergraduates now work full time, 76% of graduate students do, and 20% of those have dependents. When you're at a graduate level, uh, people who are in teacher preparation incur just as much debt on average as other people did, um, but here they're being asked to work for free and they're student teaching very often, which is of course one of the reasons that the alternative programs that allow you uh, full salary and benefits are so attractive. Um, so we need to be sure that we don't increase debt while people are doing their clinical practice learning in that year long placement, that side by side work with a teacher. College costs are actually um, a really important part of this affordability piece, but two thirds of college costs, up to two thirds of college costs can be related to your living expenses, not tuition, because there are tuition supports that come through financial aid. So thinking about how to identify what college, what living expense costs are and ways that you can reduce those living expense costs for candidates is an important aspect for affordability. And finally, for diversity, uh, we know from some really great research out of ACTE that candidates who come from white backgrounds who are in teacher preparation programs come from families that have on average $90,000 of income a year to draw on, whereas candidates of color in those same programs come from families with half of that at their disposal. At their disposal. Next slide. 
And uh, finally, this is sort of a way to think about how can we get out of this financial affordability problem so that everybody can afford to go through one of these high quality programs. Just one idea. Our program works on a lot of different ideas. Here's one idea for how we could start to fund some of those. If you think back to that 20, 10 to $20,000 a year per teacher, and when we know that 25 to 35% of turnovers from first or second year teachers, that's recurring costs for teachers during that first couple of years when they don't have enough experience to do a really strong job with student learning. So if we can reduce that turnover and then take that, to, let's just take the low end, 25% um, of the total turnover costs uh, that are, ex, that, that are um, estimated from across the country, which range from 2 billion, 2.6 billion at low ends to 8 billion, depending on what you include in the models. And just go on the conservative side of 25% of that 2.6 billion is $650 million in annual recurring expenditure for early career turnover costs. That money could buy 32,000 residents or GYO teachers funded at 25,000 each, which is a pretty generous uh, funding level compared to most programs right now. 54 million hours of tutoring at 12 an hour or 15,800 new teachers at the average new teacher salary. So it's one of the ways that we can figure out um, how to start funding candidates to go through these high quality programs to best serve students. And from now, I'm gonna turn it to the next, uh, the next set of this work, which is a wonderful panel. We're gonna hear from these are practitioners who are leading innovative programs that are making a big difference in students' lives. Thank you, Karen, so much for the informative presentation and framing for today's conversation. My name is Amaya Garcia, and I'm Deputy Director of the Pre-K-12 Education Program in the Education Policy Program at New America. I am thrilled to be joined by this esteemed group of panelists, all of whom who are working to transform teacher preparation. Today, I am joined by Tanya Hogan, who is the Director of Undergraduate Student Success in the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Colorado, Denver. Sherelle James, who is Executive Director of Urban Teachers in Baltimore. Bernard Kuntz, Executive Director of Teaching, Learning, and Leadership in Highline Public Schools. And Amber Thompson, Clinical Associate Professor and Associate Chair of the Teacher Education Program at the University of Houston. Welcome and thank you for being part of our event today. So I'm going to start off by asking all of you just to tell us a little bit more about the work. Um, all of you represent programs that are thinking outside of the box and preparing teachers in close partnership with local school districts and with intensive and guided clinical training. To begin with, it would be helpful to hear from each of you about how the design of your, the design of your program, the candidates that you serve, and why or how this strategy has been impactful. Um, Tanya, why don't we start with you? Hi, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, so I work um, at CU Denver, and our program is called NextGen. It is a, an undergraduate teacher residency program. We are a grow your own program and partner with our districts in as it was mentioned earlier in co-constructing this, we did start off being grant funded, but now we are under, um, uh, the university has adopted the program. Our students, we start recruiting from high school and we partner with all our uh, pathways programs from high school. So pathways to teaching, the cadet programs, um, we, we host events early on um, in, in, during their senior year to get them interested in and have that straight pipeline into our program. Um, we specifically are trying to diversify the teacher workforce. So uh, the program was created specifically for students of color, first gen and um, linguistically diverse students. The needs in our district, we have a lot of bilingual programs and um, are in need of having students who can teach in Spanish in our largest district that we partner with. Um, so we, they start off and we start supporting the minute they're interested in our program. And so we know some of those barriers are the application process, um, how to apply to our university, how to move through those steps. So we connect early on with them and help them through that particular process. Uh, we have a summer bridge program that prepares them uh, for their role they're going to have in the school. So we start with them in freshman year and they we've partnered with our districts to have a paid para internship. Um, we call it's a paraeducator intern position that we've created with them. So they are getting paid 
to work out at the schools Monday through Friday, 8 to 12 in the morning, and then they come and take courses in the afternoon. Uh, we have been able to fund some of it in some districts through work study, and then in other districts, they're hired as employees of that district and serve that dual role. We have found that is a great way to support that financial piece while also getting early field experiences, learning the lingo of the district, of that they're in the curriculum, how things operate. Um, and then they get early coaching and feedback because it, 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 our program is situated within the larger residency schools. There's a site professor and a site coordinator that is also at each school. The students get a lot of feedback, get lots of coaching and feedback early on um, as they start off as paraprofessionals. And um, because they have the intern part attached, we meet the students where they are. If it's a more experienced student, they're gonna move along faster and have more experiences leading up to, they may be running and planning their own groups, teaching in whole group and, um, and varied experiences. Uh, the other part that the program provides is we have monthly cohort meetings where that space is pretty, is, is, those meetings are actually with me. We meet together. It's kind of a third space where the students can really bridge their learning from their courses and what's going on in the district and be honest about it, right? So they're going to see things that aren't okay and they need that space to talk about them. Um, we have found that having those real conversations and not sugarcoating anything and addressing the, the critical issues in education actually helps the students be more prepared. Why are teachers leaving the profession? Why are teachers of color not staying within their schools? And the more we have those conversations, the better prepared they are and know what those challenges are going to be going moving forward. But in those cohort meetings, we support them with anything that they need support with. Um, we also have wraparound support. So every student gets a success mentor that uh, ensures that they're doing well in their classes, that they have a good, strong work-life school balance um, and support them in all the navigational parts of either getting hired into the district, filling out the work study form or just other things that happen at the university and all that paperwork. So we're kind of helping in that situation. So it's not all on them and they don't feel overwhelmed by some of just the policies and procedures that we have that deter our students from moving forward. Um, similarly, we help them with those li licensure tests and the praxis in particular, uh, having extra supports, modules, resources, group time. Our program is very collective, so we work together um, uh, to support each other. We've got peer mentors that mentor the next generation and help them move along in that way. And then once they get to senior year, they join up with our students doing their more traditional residency year, the professional year. Um, and we still provide that support. Because we're partnered with different districts, our students also get priority hiring in the districts. And uh, there's a lot of support with resumes, interviewing, and getting them placed within the district. And as a result of all of that, our students are um, having better scores on their evaluations compared to other uh, first year teachers and are staying in the profession uh, longer than uh, their counterparts because, again, they're aware of what they're getting into from the beginning and working on that. I could keep talking about this for <laughs> a long time, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Sherelle? Hi, yes, thank you. Also happy to be a part of the panel. So um, I am uh, the executive director of Urban Teachers in Baltimore, as you said. Urban Teachers is also in Dallas and DC. Um, we are certainly identified as in function as a residency program. Uh, we are also thought of as a teacher development program and certainly we regard ourselves as a teacher development program that provides a full spectrum of services um, as a talent pipeline solution exclusively in Baltimore through partnering with Baltimore City Public Schools and our most high need schools. Um, we do everything including recruitment, um, onboarding and induction, clinical preparation, um, guaranteed job placement because we work exclusively with Baltimore City Public Schools. Not only did we provide our, our uh, teachers with a 14 month residency, but we also walk them through the hiring process to make certain that they have job placement. And then of course, we have a lot of focus as well on retention. I think one of the bedrocks of our program certainly is that we have a 14 month residency. 
where all of our aspiring teachers um, have a summer, a school year, and then a second summer where they're working directly with experienced um, effective teachers in Baltimore City Public Schools. And so they have that 14 months of up close, personal um, proximate work um, in the school. So they get to know not only the profession, but also the communities in which they will serve because we work exclusively in urban settings, also the students, um, and that we begin to build um, their confidence and their ability to do the work in our classrooms in Baltimore. Um, I'd say another thing that really makes our program stand out in addition to having 14 months of residency where they're working alongside an experienced teacher in Baltimore City Public Schools, we also provide three years of coaching. I think we all would agree that um, teaching is not easy and it's not something that uh, someone should be left for themselves to figure out. And so while they're getting practical experience in a clinical setting, um, they are also earning their master's um, degree. And we have three programs of study that is um, elementary education, secondary math and secondary literacy. So they're getting clinical experience. They're getting theory as well as practice. Um, alongside earning their master's degree. And they have three years of coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching. And so we too have a lot of wraparound supports um, for our teachers because obviously the end goal is to have um, retention of our teachers so that they stay long enough, as we heard earlier in this presentation, stay long enough to really have impact for students and to really begin to perfect their practice. And so that's what the 14 month residency allows them to do, to have safe practice, but practice practice that's moving towards um, perfection. I know you'll probably have a lot of other questions where, where probably I can expound, but I think I've named some of the bedrocks of the, of the offerings through urban teachers in Baltimore. Thanks so much. Uh, Bernard? Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Bernard Kuntz, and I work for Highline Public Schools in the just outside of uh, Seattle, Washington. And we have a close partnership with Western Washington University, which is about 100 miles to the north of us. And our program is focused on supporting the development of um, our current bilingual paraeducators who have completed uh, an, an, an associate's degree and are seeking to complete their bachelor's degree um, and, and get a teaching certificate that will prepare them to work in our dual language programs, which are, which are growing quickly. Um, so a little, I'll talk just briefly about the school district a little bit and our needs and then I'll, and then I'll describe the program a little bit. Um, so our school district has some pretty bold goals that are driving the need for the program, which is to have all of our students graduate bilingual and biliterate, which has caused obviously a big increase in our, in our dual language programs which are in Spanish, as well as a Vietnamese program. And we have kind of long-term aspirations to, to launch a few other languages as well, but need to make sure we have that pipeline of teachers that can come in. So after um, you know, the initial years of that program, really you know, struggling to find teachers that, um, that had the skills that wanted to stay in our program, um, we tried a lot of things and then landed on, on this program is a way to get awesome teachers that are rooted in the community and really open up opportunities for folks that may not otherwise um, be able to navigate into the career of education. So that's just briefly a little bit about the school district. Um, and so the kind of nuts and bolts of the program. Um, so it is, a, it is a direct partnership with Western Washington University. Um, they provide, um, they, they provide the academic program and partner with the school district on the design of the courses. Um, some of the courses are taught by adjuncts that are also Highland Public Schools um, staff, but there's also tenured faculty that, um, that teach courses as well. The courses are offered on site um, within our school districts, so our folks don't have to travel back and forth. And obviously, they've been on they've been online. Um, but the, we've actually in the initial years of the program, we intentionally um, did have live classes, and a big part of that was about developing that strong cohort model and really creating a strong collective sense of what we're doing as a teaching community, rather than having folks go off and do things on their own and then try to navigate it on their own. And that's been a really big learning for us is keeping those folks together. Um, it's a strong cohort. So folks work for two years full time. They're working as bilingual paras. They are matched with a teacher who they spend at least half their time with. Um, and that's their mentor teacher. Across the course of the two years, as they're learning things in their courses, they're able to try things on and, um, and, and fine tune their practice. Um, they're also learning how to use our materials and learning the instructional approaches that are specific to our school district um, as they're doing that. 
And so um, after two years, they graduate with a bachelor's degree as well as a teaching certificate and they're ready to go in our, in our programs. Um, we have a real super high um, rate of hiring folks that we've trained and that's sort of a, the game plan, obviously. Um, and another really important partner um, is our um, is some of our state agencies that have really worked with the legislature um, to line up funding sources to help support both the institutions to offer the program as well as a forgivable um, loan program that um, takes out a big chunk of the worry around the um, around the tuition. So we address the tuition need as well as address the um, the employment need because folks are working for us while they're doing it. So I could talk on and on about the program, but that's a, a quick sketch. Thanks, Bernard. Um, and Amber, why don't you close us out with telling us about the program in Houston? Great, thanks. Thanks for being here, um, for allowing me to be here. Um, I'm a little giddy today. I've seen students for the first time since February 2020, just this morning. And so I'm, I'm kind of all hyped up. So um, I will try to make sure that I speak quickly. Um, I am the uh, associate chair and I have the privilege of running the teacher education program at the University of Houston and so in Houston, Texas, right. Um, we um, have about a thousand students in the program at any given time. We certify about 400 a year. Um, most of what I'm talking about today, most of our students are in a what we call traditional undergraduate program. So they are they are undergrads. They have not um, graduated with their bachelor's yet, and they're seeking their um, teaching certificate um, as an undergrad. So if you think of our program as the last two years, so their junior and senior year, um, that's where we have about a thousand students in the program at any given time um, with 400 out in the field student teaching completing a, a residency. Um, and I will say sometimes people will say, oh, it's a decent sized big program. Um, but um, uh, HISD, Houston Independent School District, hires about 1,500 teachers each year on average. Um, and that's only one of 35 surrounding districts. And so that is, we are a very a small um, portion of, of what is needed in the greater Houston area. Um, so a little bit about our program. Um, we Our junior year is, you know, foundational coursework. Um, you know, they do have some students have some field experiences, those kinds of things. Um, but really our, our capstone or our kind of bedrock is also the senior year residency. Um, I'll tell you, we've had a senior year residency since 2012. We've had a variety of um, formats. So if you ever want to talk about things that don't work so great, um, contact me offline um, because I have some, some things to share with you. Um, but in 2015, we really um, went through um, kind of a, the beginning of an overhaul of our entire uh, program and really um, transformed it into what it is today. Um, the like I said that last year of the student teaching residency um, or of the program is a student teaching residency where our students are placed placed in cohorts out in districts. Um, they are assigned a site coordinator um, who is their field supervisor meets with them weekly um, completes their observations gives really um, sustained coaching uh, for those students. That site coordinator also, one of the, the things that we're really excited about is, is just how deep our partnerships have become with the local school districts and co-constructing what the residency looks like and really looking at this as we're, we're supporting and preparing the student teachers together rather than we we prepare them at the university and then you know say take it away um, districts. And so we're really working with that from the start. Um, that site coordinator does meet with um, mentor teachers uh, by um, uh, quarterly. They also meet with uh, the administrators quarterly and governance, shared governance meetings where we share data and really talk about how to best support students. One of the things I will say um, that I wanted to make sure I talked about was, you know, one of the mission the mission of the College of Education is to eradicate health and educational disparities. And one of those, the, re, the, the ways we do that is really believing in the senior year residency and the practice that teachers, teacher candidates get during that year working alongside a high quality mentor teacher. You know, our hope is that they move into their first year um, as a solo teacher is more like a second teacher than a first year teacher because they've been in that teacher for, in that placement for a year. However, we know that that creates financial um, barriers, right? Or there are financial barriers to being able to be in a residency for an entire school year. So we have uh, uh, really 
sought out lots of different ways to support teacher candidates while they are in their undergrad program um, through scholarships with foundations, with um, very specific partnerships with um, particularly the Houston Independent School District as, as for Grow Your Own, where they, um, HISD recruits um, students and then they support them by paying their tuition through their four years at the University of Houston. Um, most recently, we've um, engaged in opportunity culture with public impact and um, which is providing uh, residency stipends for student teachers. Um, and working on innovative staffing to, to sustain those residencies. And so that's kind of where we are right now, really practice-based, really out in the field, lots of coaching, um, but really now working and kind of shifting to how do we remove those financial barriers and how do we make sure that all teacher candidates um, in the Houston area have access to a, a year-long residency um, so our P-12 students benefit. I think, I, I like everybody else could talk forever. So I'm, I think, that's probably that. So I will mute. Thank you. Um, so all of you mentioned the partnerships that you have with um, school districts. And we know that strong partnerships are a key component of any successful residency or GYO approach. But what are the mechanisms that make a partnership work and keep it intact? Bernard, let's start with you. What have been the key components of building and sustaining Highline's partnership with the Woodring College of Education at Western Washington University? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, I think the most fundamental thing to talk about is having two institutions that have um, shared goals and shared vision around what they what they believe in about education and are able to tap into that moral imperative of why they're doing the work. And when you're able to articulate that and share that story with each other and share that with other folks that are within your respective institutions. Um, you're able to get some longevity in that relationship that can survive different, um, you know, turns of people in different roles and, and, keep, the, and keep the relationship going. Um, so I think coming back to that's a really important thing. And I think, uh, yeah, so that's, so that, that's key. Um, I think, I think there is a piece around investing the time and energy it takes across institutions to develop relationships with folks and to spend time and understand who's going to be processing this paperwork on your side and um, who's going to do that work and let's get my person to talk to your person and, and, and have us all talk together um, so that finance people are talking to each other and the people that are directly interacting with the candidates are talking to each other. And taking, and taking some time and paying attention to that to make sure that those are happening in, in healthy ways. And then when, when things go a little sideways, um, you know, like talking about it directly and being able to, to name it and, and work through it. So um, those are a few things I think that are about the relationship between the university and, and the school district that are really critical. Um, and the last thing I think I'll say is, um, the university's decision to work with school district staff as adjunct faculty in some of the courses, I think has also been really critical in strengthening the overall relationship. Because as those Highline staff work with university-based staff, the university is also engaging them in a certain way, and that's really healthy. Anyone else can, can jump in if they have some thoughts and questions. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd also say much like uh, Bernard that uh, part of what's been so strong in terms of the partnership and in our earlier years, I would say at Urban Teachers, we probably functioned more as a vendor with Baltimore City Public Schools, just providing talent pipeline. Um, but over recent years, we've made a really strong pivot very intentionally to be a partner. And so looking at what is the vision and the goal of Baltimore City Public Schools and making certain that um, we are a sustainable part of, of those goals and the vision. And so um, that has meant that we've worked very closely uh, with the CEO of Baltimore City Public Schools, as well as the Chief of Human Capital, really understanding where our teachers needed to be placed what kinds of schools they needed to be in, making certain that our teachers, were our residents in particular, were going in in cohort groups um, so that we really can have the numbers to bring about the impact, but just being really intentional and sitting with Baltimore City to think about where our teachers were being placed 
and how that would be of service to their growth and experience to become a qualified first year teacher. And as Amber said, I think not to look exactly like what we might think of as a novice first year teacher, um, but also to make certain that we were being additive once again to the overall goals. So I think as we've moved into partnership and we are seeing um, institutionally as a way of bringing retention um, to the teacher workforce in Baltimore City Public Schools, we've just seen more in-depth conversations and strategy planning between urban teachers and Baltimore City Public Schools. I think the other thing that we've done at Urban Teachers is to make certain that we have the staffing um, to support. So we make certain that we have staff that directly support our residents and the principals that take our residents. And same thing for our fellows. We refer to our fellows as teachers of record, those who are full-time teachers. And so we now have staff that support our fellows and that also work with the principals. Um, who hire our fellows. So building our capacity to be available to our school partners on a daily basis, I think has certainly strengthened our partnership. And then our coaches, because we do most of our work in person pre-COVID, our coaches actually go into the schools. And so the more participants, the more residents and fellows we have in a school, the more often you see our coaches. And so what that has done for principals is give them another person in the building who can help to support instruction because when our coaches go in, in particular with our residents, our teachers um, who are being trained to become full-time teachers, um, we hear their host teachers, their mentor teachers say, my practice got better as a result of your coach coming in and working with the resident because some of our teachers have been out of formal training for some time. And so they get to also work with and benefit from having a coach in the building. So I think just becoming a fabric, um, of what our school system is working towards and just being integral um, in the work and having more conversations and being more intentional about how we plan together and work together has certainly strengthened the partnership. And I think you don't really have a partnership if you aren't planning together and talking together about what's working and what's not, and then you know try, try again kind of thing. And I'll, I'll follow up. Um, similarly to what Cheryl and Bernard have said, I think relationships is important. The, the district we partnered have partnered with for seven years, which is the longest and our largest district. I worked in that district prior to coming to the university for 16 years. And so um, the relationships being built is, is equally as important in co-constructing what that's going to look like. Um, we've reached a point where we're very honest with each other, like we can give criticisms of, of, you know, what do we need to improve at the university level, what needs to be improved at the district level, and that openness has allowed us to make quicker changes based on what our students are telling us. So they know the students are going to be very open and honest with me, and then the district knows the principals will be honest with our district partner. And so when we meet, and we meet every other week with that district partner, um, those conversations and, and that these are a place to problem solve, look at the strengths of the program, where we want to go. Both of us are very committed and focused on equity. So we're looking into how do we improve the program and make sure that the students are getting that high quality experience and that the students can are then getting hired into the schools. And um, thankfully, because it's such a strong program, once the students show what they can do and how they're transforming those scores and the relationships with their young students that's just more you know that they want more, they want more of our students and so that that's easy to get them more students is like okay if you are supporting them strategically as we go but this is why we have to constantly be talking because it can change and the students may bring up an issue that is going to be a difficult issue to talk about, but it's exactly why we don't have Black and Latino educators staying in the profession. And so let's talk about it and see what we need to do. Um, so I would say that that relationship and openness it, 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 it is, is key. We're with other districts, and I'll say that we're not there yet with the other district. This takes time to build that. And once we can get there, we will be able to do the same with the other districts. Um, and then I also forgot to say in the other part, we also have a whole financial thing. Uh, the, the district helps us scholarship our students. So they get a $2,500 
tuition scholarship each semester. And then when they get to that residency year, um, with this current district, we have uh, figured out how to do $1,500 a semester for them while they're in that professional year to alleviate that whole, how am I going to pay, how am I going to work and pay for this during that year. Again, this district sees the need and what what's coming out of the program, and so they continue to fund it. We were worried with COVID and all these budget cuts, and that stayed. And so that, again, shout out to that district because they were committed and kept it going. Um, and we have one other district that now has committed to that stipend uh, for the re residency year. But again, it's ongoing talks and sharing the results of what this can be and how education can be transformed from our students um, that traditionally have not been supported through the programs. I echo everything everyone has said. And I, the, I think the only thing that I would, I'll add is if you have the opportunity as far as partnerships um, to, to onboard. So if you can even um, meet with um, district partners or in, in, in uh, ed prep providers prior to even placing students and that we have found that is that has made a great um, difference and kind of the, just really spending a lot of time meeting up front and really thinking about what um, the, the program is going to look like. We establish all the what do we do when things are, are going awry. Um, it takes a lot of time, um, but it is time well spent, I will say. And so the more that you um, meet at the beginning or even um, continuously, uh, we found that that's made a huge difference as far as our partnerships. Um, along with the shared governance, so I mentioned the site coordinator, um, they are the kind of the linchpin um, of, of our program and they do meet regularly um, to share data, um, to talk about district initiatives and how the university can support those initiatives, um, the, to ask for curriculum. We, we are in lots of different districts and have lots of different curriculum. And so we wanna make sure we're including that curriculum um, or, or our teacher candidates know how to use it. Um, you know, these schools are investing a lot of time, energy and resources in the resident. And so we want to make sure that we include district initiatives and district curriculum so they can pick them up um, pretty easily at the end and, and those students are ready to go. And then the only other thing I'll say is just to, to listen to each other. So like for our, us and our partners, you know, if they if we're, they're going to talk about communication or better communication or if they need if something's just not working or, uh, you know, listening um, more than you should talk, which is, I know, interesting as much as I've talked, but, um, and then show them how you've attended to those, those things um, once you've, once you've really heard concerns or, you know, or needs and things like that, and just really, really listen. So just thinking about uh, the residency component or the really on the intensive on the job training, um, Amber, I was actually hoping you could talk to us a little bit about why this type of approach should be an integral part of teacher preparation and why it is such an important part of the program um, in Houston. Yeah, so we do believe that teachers or uh, that students should have um, a classroom ready teacher on the for the first day. Um, we, I, we, I will say we talk about um, learning um, before they're responsible for um, a whole group on their own. And so we're, we're really committed to that. I'll say we also are very committed to um, practice-based teaching and really having opportunities for candidates to practice and establishing pro professionalism and an instructional performance gates. So we know um, through coaching and, 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 and observations, we do have certain benchmarks that teacher candidates have to demonstrate both professionally and um, instructionally before we'll, we certify them and put them in front of students um, for learning. And so some, a lot of it is, is, is belief, right? And really feeling um, that we, we need to know that when we certify someone and we let them out um, to the districts to be higher, that they, we can feel confident that they're gonna um, bring positive outcomes to, for students. Um, is really kind of our, our, our the, what, what grounds us. When I mentioned the mission about eradicating um, educational disparities, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a task, right? Especially for now. And so we're, um, we, we believe that that is by um, having a teacher candidate work alongside a master or mentor teacher, um, practicing their craft for an entire year and, and moving in for that second year. Um, I, I hope I, I, I touched on Hopefully. Anyone else can jump in if they want to share their thoughts on the 
on the need for this more intensive residency based yeah. approach. Yeah, I, I think I totally, you know, Amber, yes, you touched on it for sure. Um, and I think also like I, when I think about when we talk about residency at Urban Teachers, we're always saying we equate it to the medical, the whole idea of a medical residency, right? So it doesn't matter how much you've studied, um, you know, theory, um, none of us want someone to say, yep, I've looked at a lot of books, I've seen a lot of pictures, you know, all that kind of stuff. I've, I've been closed up in my room for years studying and now I want to, you know, just practice on you. And I think, I mean, because your life literally is in their hands and we want teachers to be thought of the same way. Someone's life is literally in your hands. And so we owe it to students because we know most often novice teachers go into um, urban settings or underserved settings. And so we owe it to our students and their families to say that this is someone who we've invested in. We've invested in them first to prepare them to now invest in your children. And so as Amber said, I think some of it is just philosophical, but also what we know to be right for children. And I don't, you know, we can no longer have our children being experimented upon. Um, that's not why, why, why they are there. Um, and I think we just have a responsibility. And also, again, if this is about a retention of teachers, then they need and are and entitled to this practice. Many of them come to us from varying backgrounds. And so it's not just time for them to think about you know, practice and pedagogy and curriculum, but for many of them, this is their, their opportunity to think differently about the communities that they'll serve, to learn um, about the communities that they'll serve, to come in front of families and communities, um, understanding the value that they already bring to the classroom. So it's also just a time to, I guess, decode um, what some people might come to education already thinking. And I think one of the things we need to think about for residency in particular is that if we see the value in it and we have a re lot of research that we said that says there is value, then how do we think about taking away these financial burdens that many of us have named instead of programs being left to figure it out? You know, how do state agencies and, you know, federal government and like, how do we think about um, just kind of embedding this into what we think about as being a requirement? of entering the teaching profession. Um, so those are the kinds of conversations that we're having. And especially as we talk about diversifying um, the residents that we bring into the program. I know at Urban Teachers, along with Baltimore City Public Schools, when I talked about joining our goals, it's um, the recruitment and retention of more black educators um, because close to 90% of students in Baltimore City Public Schools are black and Latinx. And so we obviously want our teacher workforce to reflect that but what does that mean in terms of being able to afford um, to be a teacher, to afford uh, to earn a master's when you may already have some debt you're bringing with you from your bachelor's degree, to be able to afford to get past the barrier of praxis. And so we provide praxis supports coming in. We provide scholarship because we were awarded a $25 million grant um, for a program, Black Educators Initiative at Urban Teachers. So it helps with some of the barriers, as I said, financial barriers, support barriers, leadership and development. But those are things that separate programs were having to think of this and try it out and get funding here and get funding there. But I'd like to think that um, we could find places again where we're not having to search for this funding, but instead it's provided because we all see it as being a critical part of preparation um, for teachers to make sure the right people do get in front of our students and that we have checkpoints as Urban Teachers does along the way to make sure we're supporting people. But for the persons that this is not right for, that they don't make a mistake and get in front of our children when that's, you know, we don't want to do any more harm, obviously. So it's a, it's also a do no harm theory around the residency year, I think. Um, so all of you have touched on this, this idea of, you know, the financial side of this, but when we think about that, that's a question of scalability and sustainability, right? If we can't actually fund all the candidates, then it's hard to not just grow the program, but keep it going. So in order to truly transform teacher preparation, we need strategies that we can scale and sustain. So how have you tried to address these dual goals within your programs and what challenges have you faced? Um, and anyone can get us started. I'll jump in on this one and there's, um... There's a complicated challenge I wanna, I wanna bring up and kind of share to help problematize this work a little bit. Um, so we've been, we've been uh, 
fortunate in the program that I've been involved with that we have great state funding that supports us. Um, and we've been able to really ride down a lot of those barriers for, for candidates that they've been able to participate, which is pretty awesome. Um, by the time you add up the, uh, the forgivable loan scholarship and some other funds that we throw in as a school district, the, the, the cost per candidate gets really low. And there's a lot of other supports along the way that help with testing and all that good stuff. Um, to the question of scalability though, you end up with this interesting question of, but what about people that we wanna have become teachers because they help reflect our students that aren't represented in that group? They don't qualify for that program. In our case, it's folks that aren't bilingual. And so in many cases, um, we have awesome folks that are from the community that we'd like to support in becoming teachers um, that there's not a program for directly. And that becomes this, this, this complex question of, so what, what about that? And then when there are programs in some cases, they may not be as well funded and you create this, you create this imbalance of what's available when and where. And within the school district that I work in, this is a thing, it's a problem. And we have some folks that are saying, now wait a minute, we have this really well-funded program for people that are gonna go into our dual language programs, but we've got a lot of other folks we got, um, we have African American folks that are not bilingual. We have Native American folks that aren't bilingual. Um, other Latinx folks that aren't bilingual. Um, Asian American folks that aren't bilingual. And we want them to be teachers in our schools too. So what about them? And so it creates this, it creates this tension and this problem. And it really creates the need to identify multiple venues um, to create that sustainability. And also I think there's a, there's a bit of moral imperative there too, right? Because if we do one thing well, we can't rest with that. We can't be okay with that. We got to look at how are we how are we continuing the broader the broader work to get to the equity goals we have. So um, it's definitely it's definitely a problem that, that that keeps me up at night as I think about how do we continue moving the work forward. Um, and kind of where my head is right now with it is trying to get a little more sophisticated with the way we think about funding and think about almost differentiating funding a bit and thinking about a more individualized approach to say, what does this person need to make it through the program or to make it through an experience? What's the support they need? And that might look different than somebody over here um, across different groups and figuring out are there ways to leverage, um, uh, you know, uh, FAFSA, the, um, support through the FAFSA through, through some of those federal agencies. Are there some folks that may have some private means where they're able to pay some of that tuition and they might need more or less? Those, those questions get really complicated when it goes beyond giving everybody the same level of support. So anyways, that's a little bit about some of the complication and some of the um, tough questions that we're struggling with around, around that topic. Wow. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the complications or, or or some of the ways that we've we've addressed it, I will say, let's start with the, the complication. The complication is it's expensive, right? And um, quite frankly, when um, you're, we're really have amped up the support um, from the field supervisor there, we've lowered the number of student uh, teacher residents that are assigned to a field supervisor, those things are expensive, right? So not only is it there are financial situations with students and having a barrier to be able to participate in the residency, it's also um, often times um, expensive at the, the university level. And so we, we've had to, we've had that challenge and we've had to, to deal with it. And um, we have really, we've reallocated some funds at the university. Um, I know that that's, that always takes a while. Um, however, one of the things that I would say has been, um, been able to help us address the scale and sustainability is really um, leaning on our district partners to help us cost share some of that, um, some of the, those expenses. And so not only for teacher resident stipends, but also to support, to help us support a site coordinator um, and, and kind of chip in some of that where we're, we're, we're co, um, 
co-constructing co and also co-financing um, sometimes some of the some of those things and and uh, you know we we have about 35 school districts in the Houston area all who want our student teachers and we don't have enough for them right and so sometimes if it's a small number uh, of teacher candidates we can't financially support that and so a district will come in and say if we can find a site coordinator if we can um, pay that site coordinator can we have um, a few students out in the, in the schools and then we can do that right and so those are some of the ways and then the only the other thing that I'll say as far as um, what I'm really really excited about um, because it all because it not only is supporting removing financial barriers for teacher candidates but it's also helping the universities think about um, sustainability is um, some work that we're doing with a few districts uh, here and some innovative staffing models them um, districts reallocating um, uh, positions to free up um, funds that would be able to not only pay the student teacher a resident, I mean, a, the teacher resident a stipend, they also be able to kick in some for the field supervisor um, and also creating um, a kind of a teacher leadership ladder for um, for teachers. So we want to keep the best teacher for in-service teachers. So we want to keep the best teachers in, you know, working with kids. And But often, you know, that teachers, if they want to increase their salary, they have to go into a different position. And so those innovative staffing models freeing up um, funds are able to support three different buckets, the teacher resident, the, the university, and also um, provide stipends for some teacher leaders on, on their campuses. And so um, happy to talk about that um, offline with anybody, but it's been one of the things that I've been really excited about as far as um, trying to address some of our uh, scale and sustainability in, on, from both ends. Thanks, so we have about five minutes left. And so I wanna to get to some audience questions. Um, so one question that came in, and I, I think Tanya can probably help answer this, is how do you co-construct residency programs with multiple school districts? What changes and what doesn't from partnership to partnership? Sure. Uh, well, we create it with them to begin with, but I think the non-negotiables are the type of mentor that our students are going to have and the type of coaching feedback, like those systems, the on-site meetings and professional learning that happens, those are all going to, the, the parts of those are going to stay the same for them. Um, I think then after that, there's differentiation. So, it's, and, and, and I'm talking about, again, our program, we partner with them and when our students are undergrads, freshmen, sophomore, junior year. So I, that's that one piece. And then for that professional year, obviously the expectations, assessments, all, all of that is very consistent across, um, there's more flexibility in our paraeducator pipeline to adjust to what this, uh, the, the schools need. The beautiful thing about that is that when each district is doing something that both supports them, like we believe in simultaneous renewal, we need to be getting stuff and they need to be getting stuff. And so um, they come up with some really cool, innovative things. So what we did was, about three to four times a year, we have a collaborative council where we bring together all our site coordinators, site professors from across the districts. Principals are invited to join. And then we also bring our faculty, our teacher ed faculty to be part of that as well. Um, recently, we started inviting the HR reps because due to COVID and all of that, there were a lot of system access issues. And so we needed them to be present in those conversations as well. But that's a space where we share and can um, make sure that the parts that are important are, are consistent. We can do professional learning together. And then again, opportunities for the districts to share. Sometimes it's within district that they're sharing just because those two partner schools don't have opportunities to be sharing and, and finding out about other things that are going on. Um, so I would say uh, that that is, that's one way. Um, the other thing is too, with this financial piece, I just want to go back to that because this has helped us as well. We're upfront with the students right now, in a way it's unequitable. Not all our districts provide the stipend in professional year. So all the students want to go to the two districts that do provide them. We are honest and upfront with the districts. We tell the students ahead of time that creates a competitive factor of if you don't have the stipend, what are you, you got to sell your district. What are you going to provide for them from not getting the stipend? And so it's really making, it kind of puts it on the district of like thinking like, yes, they're all going to want to apply for the other one, but that also in a way helps with, well, what are the other districts doing? What do, how are they promoting like, you know, their district or what are they saying? Why you should come 
come work because ultimately the grow your own is about hiring them in your district and so it's that long-term relationship and then on the other end because we I want to make sure students know of their rights as both a student and an employee later on. And so that's something I'm passionate about and make sure that they know all of that. And so we teach them what questions to ask districts. And you're also choosing a district and a school that aligns with your values and where you feel affirmed and valued. If you don't feel that, you do not take that position. And I think we need to teach our students to be, they have that power and they, 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 they hold that power in being able to be selective in some ways um, because they are, they have had more experience and are ready and our schools want to hire them right away. And so we've never had trouble placing our students after uh, their internships because it's principals reaching out and wanting to hire them. But we do share across all our districts and we have meetings and um, again, lots of informal meetings with the site coordinators, the site professors, just to make sure there is consistency um, across all of it and our our students tell us when there isn't and so when there isn't we we work to make sure we bring that to the level it was expected to be we have about one minute to very quickly ask the question of how um are there common data or research needs that are common threads which help inform the success the progress and the barriers over time within teacher preparation systems in your in your experience And Karen, I think you can feel free to chime in too. I will say one of the things that we are really working with um, as far as to inform success, progress, uh, things is really trying to, to get at um, how well our, our teacher candidates are doing in their second year as far as impacting student student success, student achievement. Um, you know, all of our, we have a huge need for teachers in Houston, so they all get jobs. So you can't, you know, we can't, if we want to use, are they hired? Yeah, that. but that, you know, that's not giving us a whole lot of, of of super um, helpful data given um, the shortage in the Houston area. So we're really wanting to think about how we can um, how we can best measure whether or not our teacher kids are effective when they get there. And so we have not figured that out yet, but as far as it needs, that is that is a need um, for us to really think about think about that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that concludes our first panel and now I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Melissa Tooley, who will be um, talking about the policy strategies that could help um, truly innovate um, and transform teacher preparation. Thank you, everyone. That was a fantastic panel. We learned so much from you. Um, I'm Melissa Tooley. I'm the project director of Educator Quality at New America's Education Policy Program. And I am excited to introduce some of my panelists for this conversation about policy actions that can help promote these kinds of transformative teacher preparation. I have Eric Duncan, a P12 data and policy senior analyst at the Education Trust. Alexandra Manuel, executive director at the Professional Educator Standards Board in Washington State. Ryan Saunders, a policy advisor at the Learning Policy Institute. And Marla Useli Kashyap, senior director of educational issues at the American Federation of teachers. Thank you all for being here with us today. I'm excited to dive into talking about these different policy actions that could help sustainably support and further scale these kinds of models. But first, just wanted to get your reactions to what you've heard so far in this prior panel. Um, feel free to share your you know, overall take, but particularly interested if there was anything new or um, surprising that you heard today that made you reflect on sort of what you already thought. Um, so let's start with um, Alex. Can we start with you and we'll go around. Sure. Um, so great to be with you all. Um, I um, am uh, coming from Washington State. I'm the executive director for the Professional Educator Standards Board and um, really glad to see uh, Bernard talking about um, his program in Washington. But um, 
I think, you know, some of the things that I, I really heard and um, take away is that it's been important for us to prioritize grow your own programs and to really support and incentivize local um, development to really meet local community needs. So one of the things I heard, um, I think, as folks were talking about um, the work is that local communities look different for different types of communities. And so being able to, I think for us um, as an agency, we've really, um, we've used uh, what we call an alternative route block grant that incentivizes partners, districts, and preparation programs to work together and also stipends uh, candidates um, with scholarships. And part of that is, again, what we see is, is really uh, meeting localized needs. Um, and so some folks might say special education teachers are what we need, or dual language educators are really what we need. Um, there can be a variety of different um, types of needs. And I think um, allowing for that to be um, developed locally. I think another piece I heard is that, you know, really thinking about um, as we think about residencies or apprenticeships or job embedded learning alternative routes, there are some common language around what that looks like. Um, but also thinking about how are we um, really lifting up um, developing educators as adults in buildings? How do we think about um, addressing educator shortage and thinking about that from a perspective of both demographics, so race and ethnicity, but also thinking about um, geographic shortage, rural and remote versus um, uh, other areas, and also thinking about um, subject matter or role shortage. And so how do each of these kind of local contexts fit into that? Um, and I think the, the other piece of that is how does this uh, work need to continue to be innovative and look different? Um, because it's trying to serve unique needs of communities. Um, and as we think about that diversifying the educator workforce, um, who do we want to see in the classroom into the future? And how do we really be strategic about bringing all those partnerships together to make that happen? Pass it back to you. Yeah, that's really insightful. Thank you, Alex. Um, who wants to jump in next? Anyone? I'd like to run it like a conversation. So if people have sort of things that build on that, feel free to jump in. If not, I'll. Yeah, I just want to build off uh, kind of Alex's point, like the the need to also, in addition to thinking about strategy around addressing teacher shortages, both persistent shortages by subject area and geographic location, is also ensuring equitable access to well-prepared and racially diverse teachers. And that's something that goes across the spectrum of any school you're working in. And I think that's one of the pieces that I was, I was struck by, by listening to the different uh, presenters, was that very uh, localized strategic vision for how their program is going to address a specific need. Um, but also how, you know, in these conversations, as those partnerships are strengthened and they endure, those conversations can also adapt and the needs of that community may change and really thinking about how you're going to continue to address the emerging needs and build that partnership is something that I was really struck by. The, the partnerships we heard from clearly have been intensive and, you know, you heard it, it takes a lot of time, but I think it's just they've been given the space to do that and they've all invested in it. So it's really amazing to see all of that. jump in. Um, good afternoon. It's great to see everyone and be part of this. Um, my job at AFT is to help provide all the supports that we can to help our pre-K-12 educator members do their jobs more effectively and advance their profession at the same time. And it was just actually incredibly heartening to hear the panel um, and to hear those really specific and deep and diverse examples. Um, uh, what my colleagues have already pointed out, I, I totally agree with. Just a couple of things um, I would add. Um, just the, the kind of the universal roots in um, a desire for equitable access um, and for a diverse profession, that those are real drivers um, in these successful programs, um, which was super heartening. Um, and also uh, what I find always to be a really challenging sense, um, when you hear the great origin stories of things, you hear about past relationships, things that are built on, things that are initially kind of cobbled together and then have an infrastructure built under them. Um, and the challenge that we always face is where do we start from the beginning to build that infrastructure, right? How do we be, think of it in that way? And when a particular partner goes away or the district leadership changes, um, 
that those things don't um, kind of fall apart as well. Um, not suggesting that in any of these cases that would happen, but we're really not good at, um, we can make a playbook, but we're not really good at, at figuring out um, how to guide people on, on design um, and how to put up, um, hold up these instantiations that are so good in a way that doesn't get people to say, well, they had this, this, and this, and I don't, but rather, wow, how can we do that here? Um, another thing that um, I was really excited to hear about is the sense that we're not just thinking about teachers in one dimensional and traditional ways, but really thinking about professional roles and responsibilities and pathways um, in ways that say it's not all one size fits all. Um, and the notion of leadership once you're within the profession too, um, and really good expanded preparation programs provide leadership opportunities for those already in the profession. So that's something that certainly representing um, teachers who are in the profession uh, is exciting to us and that we wanna be part of. Eric, do you have anything you want to add to that? I think my colleagues uh, did a wonderful job setting it up, but uh, I was just excited to hear from practitioners and hear just how uh, passionate they are about supporting uh, the growth of teachers and, and placing teachers in the classrooms that need them the most. Uh, really excited to talk more about uh, ways that we can diversify the workforce through these initiatives uh, to add to what all of the, the folks on this panel have already said. Uh, and then I was struck by some of the uh, sort of initial conversations about data and monitoring uh, the effectiveness of these programs and sharing best practices uh, in order to disseminate that to the field. And so uh, excited about uh, a conversation about the way that I think uh, the new administration can support those efforts, but uh, excited to be here. Fantastic. Yeah, you all brought up really interesting and important points, particularly about that sort of sustainability piece, not just um, in terms of funding, um, but also in terms of sort of leadership and, and having something really become the core mission and not something um, that changes when we have different um, leaders at different institutions. So that's a really fantastic point that we sometimes overlook. Um, so we heard in that first panel, um, and in the presentation that Karen gave earlier about there's a lot of overlap between both high quality residency programs and high quality grow your own programs and that they both have these strong partnerships, deep partnerships with local communities and school districts. They both have substantive work-based learning experiences for the prospective teachers that they're trying to bring into the profession. So sort of thinking about that intersection of those two different routes, what types of policy approaches do you think could sort of simultaneously um, help support both of those types of approaches? Um, let's start with Marla. Um, I think that's a, that's a tough question, but I think that one of the most important pieces, especially if we are concerned, given the data that we do know, and you know, I, I want to cite what um, Karen presented um, in the sense that we know a ton, right? We don't always act on what we know, but we know a ton um, and things that can move us in the right direction. So I actually think that um, flexible financing mechanisms um, that privilege um, the diversity, community, um, community roots of applicants um, and uh, desire to, you know, to continue and support in community. Um, I, I was really also struck by the notion that uh, of the mindsets that are created, this just doesn't about putting skills in people's hands. It's about a way of thinking about what we want for our children. Um, so, I think that one of the most important things we could think about are flexible financing mechanisms that allow support um, for both types of programs, but do that in ways um, that connect to connect the dots between local, state, and federal funding, um, which is something that I find really challenging. And we have a lot of disincentives um, to actually having collective financial responsibility for educator preparation of any kind. We have more barriers than incentives to being able to commingle resources and co-support people in the ways that some of the prior panelists talked about. Uh, Alex, I'm excited to hear what she has to say in talking about this because she does a really good job of talking about what Washington does to comprehensively uh, build out programming to 
support efforts to diversify the workforce. But I think the partnerships between districts and prep programs are so important and investing in those uh, in a structured way can, I think, take advantage of some of these dual benefits or multiple benefits that all of this type of programming can support. Uh, so I'm excited to hear more, Alex, not to put you on the spot, but she does a really good job and she's talked a lot about just the comprehensive ways that Washington State has invested in those types of partnerships, prioritizing uh, candidates of color, candidates who can support some of the diversity goals that they have from local communities, but also get the right type of preparation to ensure that uh, they're uh, prepared to enter the classroom at, on day one or whatever we want to call it. Uh, and I think so uh, those are just, I think, those sort of core components and a good investment or set of investments around the partnerships between thoughtful partnerships between uh, prep programs and districts, I think we'll we'll suss those out. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I'm sure Alex will talk about that, but uh, other states, I think, have done a good job of saying we are prioritizing these types of partnerships. Here are some of the components that can include residency models or induction programming, mentoring support, uh, but also the recruitment from a certain set of, of folks uh, that are members of the community, invested in the community, and uh, are invested in, in sort of staying in the classroom and uh, supporting members of that community. All right, Alex, you've been put on the spot. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm happy to uh, share a little bit more about Washington. So, I mean, a couple things is that I think when we think about, I mean, to me, this work continues to be innovative. It continues to be things where we're, we're really trying to level up and bring more uh, capacity and innovation to um, our, you know, transform educator preparation. And so to do that, while I would say policy is a critical piece of that, it's also critical to see that we're building relationships. So like you heard, you know, Bernard talking about the relationships between districts and preparation programs. You heard about um, this idea of like shared learning. How does, how do we build more capacity for um, learning across our preparation programs and our districts together? Um, I think another part of that is how do we incentivize those partnerships? And that's really critical, I think for, States, and I'll talk a little bit about how how we've we've done that. Um, and I think that another part is what what does the accountability structure um, look like that encourages um, so that so you know while I would say policy is a, is a critical part of that, I also think all of those other pieces contribute to kind of an ecosystem that kind of levels up um, the work that we want to see. I think for us, what we have. So that's a backdrop of sort of how we've considered this work. I think we think about um, incentivizing, again, partnerships, really spending the time saying the work is about districts and preparation programs surrounding candidates to be able to really deliver on, um, you know, educators that meet, you know, shortage areas are. Um, and for us, that has been really, I think, in thinking about um, job embedded learning um, that, really helps um, you know center what is the experience that we want to see our educators have that is going to translate into um, incredible you know outcomes for students and so what we have really focused on again i think is, is incentivizing partnerships um, thinking about the transition so oftentimes we have a program and then it kind of stops here and then you lose you lose um you know high school teacher academy but then how do you transition and support folks into the college um we have programs that support you know paraeducators that um are considering becoming teachers but then how do you support them all the way to that full completion so there is a really i think important role of thinking about funding and incentives as transition points and supporting folks all the way to that completion but i also think there's good policy efforts that absolutely states can be doing. Um, we've defined residency um, for our state. We've defined that under the guise of our alternative route structure. Um, we also are having conversations around what does it take for paraeducators to be um, successful in terms of uh, their job embedded journey for them to do student teaching. Um, a lot of times that can be very variant depending on the school district. Um, and so thinking about, is there a policy role in, in that space? 
Um, I think there's also uh, really defining um, at the state level, what does a strong partnership look like? And so this can include, um, for example, when we provide funding, we are we have the expectation that folks are submitting to us a um, you know MOA that includes how they will address the critical priorities that we have, which include you know things like um, recruiting uh, those candidates from populations that have been systematically excluded from the workforce, that they are addressing content geographic um, shortages, that they are strengthening a grow your own models so that it, they're really clearly showing the on and off ramps into the into the work. I think the other part is that really prioritizing what is effective job embedded learning look like and how and, and so what is the supports that are needed um, to, to do that well um, and and also engaging with our HR colleagues and professionals as well as our district leadership in that. And I think the the other part of that is how can we think about credit for prior learning? Um, I think another thing that has has brought a lot of in, interest in in terms of uh, kind of a changing landscape has been welcoming many different types of providers into that space. So we have uh, community colleges we have that are offering bachelor's degrees with teacher certification. We have um, regional service districts that are offering that. We have traditional um, colleges and universities, and all of them can um, can really design programs that best meet um, the communities that they serve. And so finding those really strong partnerships to work together has been a really, uh, I think, a critical way to, to advance the work. And I'm just going to try to drill down a little bit because first, Alex pretty much covered everything. So, uh, but I do want to give a shout out to my Pacific Northwest states because uh, both Washington State and Oregon have done something that I think is needed across every state. And a lot of states have done this, but in this space, the comprehensive vision for how grow your own programs and residencies fit into your teaching profession, like your vision for a well-prepared, sustainable, racially diverse teaching profession. And if that is embedded in all of those other pieces, then you see how it connects with building recruitment strategies that are supported by these partnerships, building you know, induction strategies. Because if you're not funding induction at the state level, you're creating inequitable access to those early career mentoring experiences that we know benefit residents and grow your own candidates and that we benefit any teacher. And that help gets them to practicing teacher, experienced teacher that can then become your mentors who kind of sustain this whole you know, virtuous cycle. Uh, so there's another big piece there where I think, again, seeing this comprehensively across the spectrum is really important. And I, again, just want to stress how Alex and Washington State have done that. Um, on the financial elements, I'm going to drill down to a few pieces I think are really important. Uh, it's important that you fund those partnerships. You give them, you know, implementation grants, planning grants. Pennsylvania's done that with their Title II dollars. California's done that with their historic investment in teacher residencies. And then also connecting those, just as we want cohort models for our candidates, cohort models for our resident planners. You know, there's states like Georgia, states like Tennessee and California who have developed kind of cohort visions for where this expertise is shared and practice is kind of distributed across the state so that it isn't just, oh, this one program's great. Let's just keep, you know, hitting that one program. It's like, how do we get this scaled across the state as we heard from the previous panel? We also want financial incentives for candidates, financial incentives for mentors and training for those mentors, because just because you're a good teacher doesn't mean you're necessarily set up to be a good mentor. And so we know states like West Virginia uh, are trying to invest in mentor stipends because they know those you need to, we should recognize the effort they're putting into these new teachers. We're expanding this clinical experience. We're expanding the need for that quality mentor experience. And so there's opportunities to train that can happen at the state level or at the district level in terms of the partnerships. But there's also opportunities to fund those kind of stipends as well. Again, very much the incentives for candidates is imperative. Uh, but again, it's also recognizing where we're, we're rewarding the expertise and really trying to hold that up. Um, and then I will also, the last kind of piece on funding is uh, with kind of, as you build up the relationships with schools and you try to incentivize you know, districts to put in their own investment in these programs, it's also recognizing the state level that we're talking about 
what are essentially professional development school models of old. You know, we've, we've re, we're rethinking them. They are a little more flexible, but essentially these are learning environments for students and learning environments for adults. And we envision our schools to be that. When you think about the examples we heard, we heard about teacher preparation coursework happening in the classrooms. We heard about adjunct professors who are classroom teachers. And we heard about those relationships. And so again, in terms of strategy and investment, those are things I think that states can really prioritize and districts can help kind of push on. Um, one last thing is that some of that investment right now can come from the recovery dollars we, uh, the federal government has made available. And, you know, Inshallah, if we get this uh, human infrastructure package, maybe we will have some additional uh, $9 billion, maybe, uh, to invest in some of this preparation work. So I'll, I'll just say that um, and uh, step back. Thank you. That's really um, helpful to hear how you all are, are thinking about this. There's a lot of overlap, I think, in how we're thinking about what the levers are that would support both for own and residencies. Um, at the same time, there are some differences that I think we highlight um, where Grow Your Own is really focused really intensely and targeted on recruiting people from the community, whereas residencies as a, as a um, pathway is sort of broader in terms of who it's trying to attract. Um, and oftentimes, again, can be recruiting people from the community, but doesn't necessarily have to be. Are there any, um, I guess, specific or additional policy steps that need to be in place to ensure that um, perhaps like with a focus on residencies that we don't also lose the sort of need to um, target specific populations in our recruitment of teachers? Or do you think that most of the policy solutions can kind of do both things at once? And are there things you would recommend doing to just make sure those distinctions are um, are evident and are, are recognized in any kind of policy. I can just, uh, I mean, I think more states are looking at kind of feasibility studies uh, or experimenting or demonstration sites of, of residency-based programs. Some, some states have started with uh, policy. Other states have started with funding incentives. Um, some, I, I would say that part of looking at that is, is how, you know, similar to like, you know, the delivery of certain uh, amount of dollars per state, um, and this is radically simplifying this, you know, could go for students um, to, to support uh, public education in, in school could, you know, it's essentially looking at, could there be uh, a figure that's developed, for example, for all student teachers or for all residents of, you know, student, for all educator preparation candidates. Um, you know, there have been a lot of, I think, uh, learnings around that. There's a lot more learnings, I think, that um, that will be taking place. There's some great leaders around the country trying, trying things out. Um, I think, you know, part of thinking about this is, is always, I think, building off of, um, you know, for state agencies, thinking about, you know, what assets do we already have? What community assets, what partnerships already exist? What, like, what uh, foundations, you know, public, private funding, political will, you know, what are all the things that we already have access to that we can help to, to guide and, and move in the same direction? I think, Ryan, you talked about um, the, you know, kind of federal funding and some changes that are happening there. I think that there are lots of different states that are thinking about like, well, how does, how does that work? How could we build off of things we have? And, and then I think absolutely critical is, is at, at the center of that is really, um, you know, what do our students need um, to be successful? What are we designing, you know, for? So how do we want to prepare educators how does residency or alternative routes or apprenticeship models help us to, or grow your own, help us to, uh, to best serve students? And how do we think about that backward um, design planning kind of as we build these structures? So I think those are some of the things I, I would say, I think many states are, are grappling with um, uh, and, and certainly I think learning a lot um, and I hope that we can continue to connect and, and learn together as, as we advance, you know, different ideas come into play. 
Yeah, on that note, I think one of the things we often wrestle with, um, both in policy and in practice, are these different labels, um, you know, grow your own, residency, apprenticeship, there's all these different terms, and we all use them somewhat differently. Um, you mentioned earlier that your state actually defined residencies as like one way to try to really be concrete about what we're, we're talking about, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I'm also curious, I know that earlier Karen referenced some of the research on residency programs. I don't believe that there is that same level of research on, for example, grow your own programs or other types of programs. And I think part of that is um, maybe a labeling issue, but part of that is um, I think we almost need to get away from labels to a certain ex extent and focus more on like the attributes of the preparation itself and wondering um, just what your thoughts are on ways to gather better information, better data about like, what are these attributes? Like, what are we sort of looking for? Which programs are doing them? What can we learn from them? How can we continue to improve and continue to transform? Because as we mentioned, you know, things aren't static, like students are changing, schools are changing, the teachers are preparing are changing. And so that we, you know, continue to evolve and continue to improve. Um, do you have thoughts on sort of what information, what data we need, and how we would use policies to make sure that we have access to that. Eric, I haven't heard from you in a while. You want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Uh, and actually, I'll uh, go back a little bit to what uh, Alex was saying and what you said earlier uh, and repeat what Ryan said. Uh, so thank you all for your amazing content so I can steal it from you. Uh, but having sort of a vision for what you want your uh, state workforce or what you want your experiences for kids to be. And I think when you set that vision, you set that plan, uh, the, some of the strategies will sort of fall into place. Um, uh, and policy, I think that can at times, and that's obviously I work in the policy space, so I'm not trying to bad mouth it, but can it at times can be a little constricting. So thinking about like, uh, we just came out with a study quick plug on, uh, programs like urban teachers. Uh, and others that are defined as grow your own or teacher residency uh, that have tried to uh, prepare folks who had after school experience. And we think that's a pretty uh, interesting uh, place to pull uh, aspiring teachers from uh, and invest in them given their, their, you know, desire to support their community, their uh, experiences teaching and, and supporting families and students uh, in their communities, and it's a more racially diverse uh, uh, candidate base to pull from. Uh, well, there are states that, uh, let's say, define grow your own as only paraprofessionals. And uh, if you're an after-school staff member, out-of-school staff member from a different class or field that that's defined as, as paraprofessional, where can a program uh, like a grow your own program get state funding to support your uh your sort of uh preparation and uh in uh eventual placement into a, a classroom i think that's where policy can be a little limiting uh but to your point melissa um i think this new sort of influx of federal funding uh investments um uh, can really give I, I think potentially a national perspective on what's the right type of data that we need what information is important for us uh, as a country and in different states uh, to test or assess the uh, viability and sustainability of some of this programming uh, in, in terms of things like uh, candidate enrollment, you know, broken down by race in terms of even I, I think some of the programs that we uh, are leaders that we heard earlier talking about uh, effectiveness, right? So uh, first year teachers, you know, we all can sort of agree that uh, experience is really important, but what's the effectiveness of teachers from certain programs in uh, uh you know the second or third year or, or how long are they staying in, in the classroom uh those types of, of answers uh to to just see what what are these programs producing and what are the practices that can be replicated uh across the country uh and sustained through uh increased funding i think are really important and i'm hopeful that the uh, new administration will take on some of this data collection uh, and transparency effort uh, to make sure that we're investing in the right types of programs that are supportive and uh, to all candidates uh, and are sort of guided towards uh, creating a more diverse and effective workforce. 
it's all stuff there I'm talking about. And I'll just kind of add a, actually, go ahead, Marla. You sure? Thanks, thanks Ryan. Um, I totally support everything that Eric said and thought your, your recent study is actually really interesting. So thank you for that. I wanna take this at a slightly different angle though, which is that I think um, while I, I agree with you know, the notion when Ryan shouted out the Pacific Northwest states with the comprehensive vision, absolutely. Um, but I think what we're also missing that is part of this, you're, you're right, Melissa, who cares about the label GYO if you're talking to somebody on the grocery line, right? Nobody does. But I think what we do need and are still lacking is a sort of common sense of why the profession needs status, why we need to care about it, how we talk about it, how we embrace it. Um, and I think when we have examples of programs that are effective, that are bringing in teachers of color, that are showing results for kids, yes, we need more data, um, but we also need to be talking about why this matters. Um, and I think that's a conversation that's been missing in our country for a really long time, or we've relegated it to uh, you know, a PSA campaign here or there. Um, but that we actually need to talk about the centrality of the teaching profession to our democracy. Um, and that transcends um, labels and how do we get there? And now we have a, a host of really good individualized and increasingly more at scale examples of how to do that. I'm just gonna problematize a little bit because I think that one of the things we're struggling with is past data efforts may not have gotten us where we want it to go. Um, and we're trying to now think about what are things we can collect both at the federal level and at the state level that is can inform this work. Um, I think, yes, retention uh, data is important. I think, you know, distribution of teachers, where they end up teaching, where they, you know, do they stay in the schools that they're prepared in? Do they move on? Um, and how do those schools stack up in terms of, uh, you know, the students they serve? Uh, and those are things that I think are really important. I think the, uh, the effectiveness data is challenging right now as we see states kind of continue to shift what they're using, what tools they're using to evaluate teachers, their systems to do that. And so um, I think that's one where I would, we could set a long-term vision for that. And there's definitely things the federal government can do. I also think we're, we're still kind of, we're, we're in a space where some of the previous efforts put us in a bit of a disadvantage to have a genuine conversation about that. And so that may, I may not lead with that one if we're trying to build data systems. Um, I also think the, the other piece um, to Marla's point is that I, we, we're trying to envision these kind of comprehensive systems. We're trying to get at what are the key pieces. And one of the ones I don't think we can really measure well, but it's pretty fundamental as well as like for all preparation, what are the types of coursework and knowledge, skills, and dispositions candidates are getting practice in developing in their programs? One of the things I've seen in a lot of legislation for GYO programs is they don't really articulate much about those types of elements. They are usually very much about like, there's some money, this money will go here, uh, we'll provide some flexibility around these requirements, and we want you to target these individuals and these programs, that kind of thing. But they, they, fall, they kind of stop short of saying, well, so what are the types of preparation experiences in addition to being in the classroom we would want those candidates to engage in? I think residencies, because of, you know, for various reasons, some of the programs that have defined residencies have gone a bit further there. And so I think that's something where there can be some work, again, at the federal level, maybe, I don't know if that's data you want to collect. I don't think that's necessarily going to be as helpful, but I do think that's something at the state level to pay attention to, but also get below the hood of like, just because you say you're doing the science of learning and development as a course, it doesn't necessarily mean you're making that a meaningful experience that can be applied and all of those things. So I don't think I've necessarily told you like an answer, but I just wanted to kind of raise some of those challenges with this work. So. Yeah, that's all really um, well taken. I think that, you know, this conversation is intended to be broad, not just federal policy, you know, but also to encompass state and local policy. And so, um, you know, to your points, like there might be things that make sense at a federal level, there might be other things that make sense at a state level, sort of depending on what, um, you know, to your point, Ryan, like what effect, you know, what effective data they feel like they can look at and feel confident in, right? Um, and that, you know, I think in general, we have in education policy moved to more of a um, more of a place where um, we are not trying to make quite as much federal policy at the sort of K-12 level. Um, and so I think um, trying to figure out where that where that sits, right, um, to be able to be used by the places that need it to make better decisions about teacher preparation. Yeah, that's great. Um, 
So we are we're running a little bit um, close on time. I wanted to ask one more um, quick question and then ask um, some a question from the audience. So I think just generally we've covered a lot here. I'm curious whether you think there's anything else we haven't talked about the policymakers need to do in order to support this sort of transformation of teacher preparation that we're talking about here. So we've talked about resources primarily in the um, sort of financial sense, but um, you know, Sherelle at Urban Teachers mentioned earlier this idea that they had to really move from being a vendor to being a partner. And Marla, you mentioned this earlier and sort of talking about this idea of like shifting mindsets. Um, and I don't normally think about that maybe as being a policy role, but I guess um, how do we sort of think about shifting mindsets or are there other things we should sort of think about to really move toward this um, new way of thinking about how we prepare teachers? So. Any last thoughts there? And then we'll get to an audience question. I'll throw in one. Um, I think that alongside, as we focus on policy and the policy supports for effective teacher preparation, I don't think we should forget that advocacy goes alongside policy. And the most effective policymakers know how to connect with and use advocacy. Um, and so I would say from where I sit that Current teachers in practice are some of the best advocates for what the profession could be and what's needed um, in classrooms today. And so I think that notion of connecting policy with advocacy and informed advocacy along the way could be really helpful. Um, the only other thing I, I was thinking of throughout all this is there's a really tough question that at every level, at a policy level, at institutional teacher preparation level, school district, teachers union, we have to ask if any of this is going to stick. And that is, what should we stop doing? You cannot run parallel systems or projects on top of programs forever. So that's what I'm leaving this thinking of today. I think one thing I, I, pre I think those are all right on those thoughts. Um, I think one other piece I think that it is around how do we uh, so we have a lot of stakeholders in education and and in the development of educators and we everybody is doing really good work and so but are they doing that work together in community and learning together I think one of the pieces that some of these future funding opportunities it, it is to then say how do we leverage the best of what you know our preparation programs are doing our districts are doing our building leaders our candidates like how do we leverage the best pieces and and design a program that really meets the needs of 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 the community so i think part of that is collaborative design and collaborative selection of candidates and um and and also that just because you design something doesn't mean it won't evolve um, or change over time, right? Um, and that's actually a, a, a healthy sign of being responsive to, to the needs of, of, of community. Uh, I think those pieces, you know, I think there, then you start to see what all do we actually have that we can build, build off of. Um, and, and, and then I think the other part is, is really, um, thinking about how we advance equity across all of those different groups and also how do um, we do that both in, you know, relationship building so uh, and mindset changing and then system changing right so that there's multiple layers of that um, and they don't have to they're not like it's not solely linear like this happens first and then this happens and that happens they all have to happen in in kind of this. Uh, partnership uh, way. And so how do we model that, you know, at every level? So those are some of the things that I just, I, I think, as, as I think about transformation, I think it's modeling um, what that can look like at every level. All right, I, that is really, um, I'm going to sit with that for a little bit, um, I think after this event, but I think that's spot on. Um, one just quick question from our our um, attendees. We had a question about um, sort of current federal funds that are sort of new to the space in the form of like ESSER funds and other funds that have flown 
flowed primarily to districts. And so we've talked a lot about um, sort of federal and state level um, change, but it, in terms of sort of local level, like how do you see ESSER funds in particular or other funding sources as playing a role or are those too short term to really um, transform something that you know takes a while to really set up like these kinds of preparation approaches? But that was a question from our audience. Um, I can give a quick answer. Others can obviously add more. Uh, I think one of the things that you see is that districts are reluctant to spend uh, because of the fiscal cliff on some of the human elements that we're talking about here. Uh, what I can say is that there's a lot of investment that can be made in your current teachers, both with an eye towards retaining them because it has been a rough stretch for our teachers and for our superintendents and for our, like it's the whole system's in struggle. And I think I've said this on a number of other instances. So uh, one of the things we were thinking about is how, like if you wanted to make a quick investment is start incentivizing national board certification right now and try to set some teachers on that path in the next few years because they can become the mentors for whatever preparation models you're building. That can also go into your new teacher induction because those new teachers who came into the system in the middle of the pandemic may not have had the preparation experiences that we're even talking about right now in the classroom. They may have been remote and so they're going to need some additional supports. We also know that, again, as states struggle with shortages, one of the things we haven't talked much about just at the front end was the, the pro proliferation of routes that don't really cover this clinical experience piece. And so those teachers are going to need support if you want to keep them in, because we don't, we can't really afford to keep replacing teachers at this rate. So those are just some things that I think, you know, if you're going to use those dollars now, um, sure, you can build a new football stadium or some capital investments that maybe districts had wanted to make for a long time. But I think those are really imperative as we think about where the workforce is today and into the next school year. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that um, the point about ensuring that we actually have mentors in schools that are able to be helping to prepare our our novice teachers is a really important point and one that I don't know that we really covered, but is something I know I've seen schools where pretty much every teacher has fewer than three years of experience. And so thinking about how do we keep at least those, you know, more experienced in that, you know, relevant space, teachers in the profession, prepare them to actually be mentors um, when there isn't that sort of depth of experience in a given school. Um, so I think that's a great point to end on. Um, well, thank you all so much for being part of this fantastic panel. I think um, you've left us all with lots to, to continue to reflect on and really appreciate your um, offering your thoughts here with us today. Um, I am thrilled to now welcome our, um, our closing speaker, uh, Roberto J. Rodriguez. He's going to help synthesize all that we heard here today and offer further thoughts on opportunities to transform teacher preparation. And Mr. Rodriguez is president and chief executive officer of Teach Plus, where he spearheads a movement to empower excellent, experienced, and diverse teachers to advance change in education that will yield success for students. He has served in senior roles in the White House and the United States Senate and is nationally recognized for his expertise in education policy and governance and for his leadership in building multi-sector partnerships with schools, families, and communities to improve educational opportunities for all children. Roberto, welcome. Thank you so much, Melissa. It's so great to be here with you today. Thanks for my, the opportunity to lend my voice today to the event. I'm grateful to the uh, really terrific insights and examples that uh, the panelists have shared, um, the excellent framing shared by Karen, and grateful to you and Elena and all, uh, the whole team at New America for hosting today's event and shining a spotlight on this really important issue. So I'll just begin my uh, quick reflection on a few factors that I see converging to create the context for the discussion we're having today, you know, and that really underscore the imperative for a new blueprint to build a uh, healthy, diverse and talented teaching profession and for us to really revisit teacher preparation in that context. I mean, we have compounding, first we have compounding effects of, of this pandemic over the last 16 months, which you know, has presented a lot of new challenges and exacerbated the gaps we've already seen that our system has long lived with around equity and opportunity, uh, the disruptions to learning, the digital divide, the challenges around taking to remote teaching and learning, 
teachers have really faced just such an unprecedented year, uh, as has already been noted. Uh, we have a second factor that's really an important backdrop that is about the work that our country has yet to do in responding to the racial reckoning across uh, our communities and bringing into greater focus the need for cultural competence and for practicing more culturally appropriate and anti-racist orientations and practices in our schools and in our classrooms. And, how, and, and this is central to how we think about uh, the preparation of our teachers and the teaching uh, practice at large in terms of how we build those systems that really recognize our students uh, for all the assets that they bring uh, to their learning and, and uh, see them uh, as themselves and, and, and re really fully value them in their backgrounds in teaching and learning. And then finally, we've experienced three decades of standards-based reform that uh, I think in some ways uh, at times shifted uh, the focus to uh, blame and burden for teachers in terms of the failures in our public education system, rather than thinking about how do we tap into uh, our teachers as assets and as, as solutions makers uh, in how we think about moving the future of teaching and learning and the, the future of our public education system forward. And so I'm excited about the opportunity to think about teacher preparation as a avenue to bring those voices in the vision of our excellent experienced and accomplished teachers forward uh, in contrast to that. So, and I think all of those contribute to the need to uh, really reestablish and reinvigorate our teaching profession as the focal point of opportunity and change in our country. It is the most important resource we can give our learners uh, in their classrooms today. Uh, our, our educators are the backbone of our public education system. And stepping back, as has been um, noted from the previous panel, this is about uh, the health of our democracy and the strength of our democracy. You know, if you go uh, around the world and look in uh, examples like Singapore, where they uh, regard their teachers as nation builders, and as leaders, uh, in not only in shaping learning in their schools, but really in shaping the future of their countries. That's absolutely the case uh, in our country as well. And what we have lacked to date has been the bold uh, um, uh, opportunity to really marshal resources, uh, marshal the public will and the, and the political will, and call upon uh, our federal, state, and local leaders to share in partnership and in accountability around how we build uh, the future of our profession. Uh, I won't go into all of the uh, components around why teaching today is in sub somewhat of a tenuous state. You all know the challenges we face around teacher recruitment, uh, teacher turnover, the significant gaps that we have in preparation today, um, uh, the work we have to do to restore public perception of the teaching profession, um, the work we have to do to uh, remedy the wage penalty that's faced by too many of our teachers as compensation continues to be a challenge and our educators earn 78 cents on every dollar compared to uh, other college graduates. Um, but I think all of those challenges call us to a more urgent approach around how we address teacher preparation and around how we address professional learning. Uh, and in order to address these challenges, I think we do need to, one, get much more serious about reshaping how we prepare our teachers and support them across their career, especially in those early years, in those first five years. And secondly, uh, bring greater urgency to the opportunities that we need to grow our teachers' leadership, knowledge, and skills across their time in the profession. Um, so as we've talked about today on that first point, it's about a bringing deeper uh, uh, and, uh, and, and more effective uh, preparation programs and induction programs and mentoring programs that, are, uh, that meet teachers where they are uh, and that are responsive to the local markets in which our teachers choose to teach. Most of them choose to teach within 15 miles of their hometown. Uh, it means we have to think about clinical prep practice and preparation in new ways. Uh, and we've done some work on this uh, within our organization at Teach Plus, we found that teachers are looking for better opportunities to um, reshape clinical practice, to 
uh, have stronger structures around moving from simple to complex tasks to be exposed earlier to uh, diversity uh, in multiple settings uh, and, uh, and to give our teacher candidates the opportunity to, to teach diverse learners, uh, including our multilingual learners, those with special learning needs, uh, ensure that they have the mentorship that they need to, to be successful and to support their growth early in the profession. And our residency programs, uh, we know have a especially strong track record of enrolling and preparing our teachers and particularly our teachers of color. We have examples that have been mentioned already today at great length. Um, uh, really, I think they are a key to, uh, to the opportunity of bridging the diversity gap that we have in our profession today. We know that uh, they are more likely to uh, uh, graduate uh, candidates of color than, uh, than their uh, peers uh, in uh, teacher preparation. We know that um, the retention rates of our uh, educators coming out of high quality residency programs, you know, 80 to 90% retained in the first five years, 70 to 80% of teachers retained even after five years, despite all the challenges that we have yet to address in, a, in, um, in, a, in working conditions and compensation and the overall health of the, of the profession. Our residency programs continue to um, really um, uh, paddle upstream on that, on that front. Um, I also think it's important to recognize our historically black colleges and universities, our predominantly black institutions, our Hispanic serving institutions, our tribal colleges and universities, the role they play having a, a demonstrated track record in, in preparing our candidates of color and, and their proximity to community, uh, to school districts and to broader community learning, um, make them ideal uh, places for us to grow a new generation of teacher preparation. Uh, and we also know we need more career ladders and pathways and more grow your own programs. We've heard prioritize to uh, support the success of our diverse educators and our educators of multilingual learners. You know, uh, previously, uh, when we think about the needs of our linguistic minority students and our multilingual learners, you know, those needs were, um, were memorialized in the Bilingual Education Act uh, that was passed by Congress back in, in the 60s and brought a civil rights context to that. At that time, the federal government was investing tens of millions of dollars in pre-service programs that would advance career ladders for paraprofessionals in high quality bilingual education programs that would help to develop an advanced curriculum in those programs that would provide over 700 projects around the country supporting professional learning uh, and professional development around second language acquisition for our emergent bilingual learners. We unfortunately lost a lot of that approach, that dedicated approach at the federal level and we need to bring that back. We need to bring back those uh, dedicated avenues and opportunities for Grow Your Own and for, and for career ladder programs, particularly for our diverse teachers and for our teachers of multilingual learners. Um, we also heard, I think on this last panel, which was really resonant for me, the important point of relationships in teacher learning. Uh, you know, and Ryan raised this point of, the reinvention of some of our professional development schools and models that are being rethought and, and, um, and reconceived. Um, you know, our teachers learn best when they are uh, alongside one another, when they have the agency and support to be able to shape their professional learning. Early in the career, uh, when they have connections to high quality mentors, veteran teachers and others that can help support and guide their path and their growth. And as they, as they progress in their career, to be able to provide more opportunities for distributed learning in our schools and for teacher-led professional learning um, that make that instructional change more durable and more customized. Um, so th th I, I'm encouraged by opportunities to think about teacher leadership in that vein, uh, encouraged by opportunities to in, that have been mentioned already to incentivize great credentialing and pathways like national board certification. We know California just made a huge investment in providing a $25,000 salary increase for our national board certified teachers in high poverty schools. And then finally, I'll just end by saying, I think there's a real opportunity, both in the examples we've heard today, the research that's been shared, 
and in and in the national conversation that uh, President Biden has opened through the American Families Plan for us to think about um, the, how we might address our teacher shortages, how we how we might improve teacher preparation and invest in our teacher leadership programs and pathways that will support our teachers early in their career and, and throughout their career. And so that's a wonderful opportunity for a lot of partners that are on this um, webinar today to collaborate uh, in support of uh, uh, a large investment, you know, a $9 billion proposal that I, I believe is a real game changer for what the future of teaching and learning and for the teaching profession could be. So thanks again uh, for the opportunity to share my, uh, my voice and my views and for your leadership in bringing us together. I'll turn it back to you, Melissa. Roberto, I think it actually is coming to me and I just want to thank you for those summary comments and I am so happy that we have a recording of this. It's going to be up on the New America website, the events page um, within 24 hours so that I can re-listen to yours and to review all that we have heard from this amazing set of panelists that came today. It's an exciting time. You can see there's a lot of great things going on. Um, all of us who put this uh, event together, thank you for coming and appreciate all of the great work going on across the country and look forward to how we can move this all together.